So today, we are going to shift our focus in our solution for the hydrogen atom, where we're going to move from looking at the angular equations to the radial equation. And that equation is known as something as the effective one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. This is an equation that we will be deriving today, and also we will begin our solution of that equation to put together our final solution for the atoms. Now that we know all of the angular portions of the wave functions, we need to now know their radial portions. Now, as we kind of shift gears like this, we have to remind ourselves of some things which had come up in a several lectures ago. As we've got all the pieces out on the table, we now have to begin to bring them all together to come to our final solution. So you may recall that previously we were working under the standard ordinary differential equations doctrine that we should try to affect some sort of a separation of variables, limiting the form of our solutions to something that can be written simply as a product of solutions with separated variables, two separate functions of the separated variables. The trigger that told us that this was likely to be good, a good approach within ordinary differential equations was when we looked at the form of the operators in our Schrodinger equation that we had to solve. Our Hamiltonian has the form that I've shown to you here. The key component of it is this Laplacian, which describes the kinetic energy operator. The other piece, the potential operator, is actually something that can change from atom to atom. When we focus on this key part, which is where most of the difficulties arise, what we found is that in spherical coordinates, we have this interesting formula for del squared, which has a radial part and then a very complicated angular part. We, however, by thinking about symmetry and building up our physical intuition, found a very intuitive way of looking at all of these, this crazy combination of operators. Namely, it is really nothing other than, apart from some factor of minus 1 over h bar squared, it's nothing other than the total angular momentum squared operator. And that then reduces our del squared to the sum of these two components. Then substituting these into our Hamiltonian, we can arrive at the equation that I showed to you up above, where now we have something that seems to have completely separated, or almost completely separated, all of the radial parts, and there's only one part into which all of the angular parts are isolated, and that is the usual reason why we think we could affect some sort of separation of variables. Now, <clears throat> when we had done that, we then landed on the equation that I've shown to you here, and our focus has been on this first angular part. And to remind us of what we learned there, we learned that the this solution to this angular equation, L squared on Y gives me a constant times this function Y back again, gives me then a very intuitive understanding of what these angular functions must be. They actually represent, as we described, a physical model of a simple freely moving particle on the surface of a sphere. And therefore, we realize that there should be a what is known as a complete set of bound states. In other words, by the quantum principle of superposition, we can take any function, any reasonably behaved function that could represent some wave function for a particle in some arbitrary state can be expanded as a sum of weights times states, where these weights actually depend on the radius and the states in this case I'm sorry this is these are the solutions of the angular equation of course then have just dependence upon those angles the very nice thing about this is that also these coefficients they in general we would expect such an expansion for the angles on the sphere of theta and phi but we can do this expansion as we had discussed for all different values of r so that our coefficients then depend upon r to solve for those coefficients, we can use the standard approaches that we've learned for bound states, namely to get the expansion coefficients, we simply take the Hermitian inner product of our pure states then with our function. The last observation that I'd like to make on this particular topic is that since this applies to any function f of r, it of course also would apply to any possible bound state solution. So that we know we can write in full generality now, without any underlying assumptions or restrictions on the functions that we're, we are looking for, any bound state then as a linear combination, as a sum actually, of products of radial parts times angular parts, where again we know how to extract those radial parts. 
What I'd like you to notice is that this equation is completely general. It makes no underlying assumptions. It's much more general than the restrictive assumption that standard separation of variables makes. So what I want to do today is actually to derive this radial equation, the radial parts of this equation, not from this assumption, which has restrictions, but rather from the more general expansion that we are guaranteed to have under the quantum principle of superposition. Finally, in order to derive the equations for these R's, we need this last key piece of information, which was the bottom line solution to the angular portions. The one piece that carries forward that we need to know is this value of this constant A. Rearranging this equation, again, we see that what uh, the, the constant A represents then are the allowed pure values of the square of the angular momentum operator. And we had a very nice simple expression for those. They are just the magnitude of the angular momentum lambda squared times h bar squared, which we proved had to have the form L times L plus 1 times h bar squared. And as we had discussed, the allowed values of A come when L takes on any non-negative integer value, starting at zero and counting up in what have to be integers up towards infinity. So our task then now is to take all of this information and to begin with this expansion and then derive for ourselves this so-called effective one-dimensional Schrodinger equation.